these guys are just weird. That's who they are. So it ain't, it ain't much else. Don't give them the power. Look, are they a threat to democracy? Yes. Are they going to take our rights away? Yes. Are they going to put people's lives in danger? Yes. Are they going to endanger the planet by not dealing with climate change? Yes. They're going to do all that. But don't lift these guys up like they're sometimes the heroes. Everybody in this room knows. I know it as a teacher. A bully has no self-confidence. A bully has no strength. They have nothing. The fascists depend on fear. The fascists depend on us going back. But we're not afraid of weird people. We, we're a little bit creeped out, but we're not afraid. But look, and then as you heard this, and one day ago, a poll came out and showed Kamala Harris up 10 points and Donald Trump getting his ass handed to him here in Minnesota. So, sorry. But... He's here today in the state of hockey to complete his trifecta. He lost in 16, he lost in 20, he loses in 24. Stand up. Hello and welcome to your week. Who am I to welcome you to your week? It's the final Monday of July. It's July 28th, if you're listening, on this day. And I've got the great Mara Quint joining me. She's always awesome. That conversation begins at 28 minutes into today's show. I hope you had a great weekend. And I want to open the show by reading from Heather Cox Richardson, the great historian that we all celebrate, who, by the way, retweeted me yesterday. She writes that just a week ago, it seems a new America began. I've struggled ever since to figure out what the apparent sudden revolution in our politics means. I keep coming back to the Ernest Hemingway quote about how bankruptcy happens. He said it happens in two stages. First, gradually, and then suddenly. That's how scholars say fascism happens, too. First slowly, and then all at once. And that's what's been keeping us up at night. But the more I think about it, the more I think maybe democracy happens the same way, too. Slowly, and then all at once. At this country's most important revolutionary moments, it seemed as if the country turned on a dime. And then she goes through history and talks about all of those different occasions from 1763 to 76 to the 1850s to 1853. She says the same pattern was true in the 1920s. Every time we expand democracy, it seems we get complacent, she writes, thinking it's a done deal. We forget that democracy is a process and that it's never finished. And when we get complacent, people who want power use our system to take over the government. They get control of the Senate, the White House, and the Supreme Court, and they begin to undermine the principle that we should be treated equally before the law and to chip away at the idea that we have a right to say, that we have a right to a say in our government. And it starts to seem like we've lost our democracy. She says the last several decades, it felt like we were fighting a holding action, trying to protect democracy, first from an oligarchy and then from a dictator. Many Americans saw their rights being stripped away, even as they were quietly becoming stronger. That strength showed in the Women's March in January 2017, and it continued to grow quietly under Donald Trump and more openly under the protections of the Biden administration. People began to organize in school boards and state legislatures and Congress. They also began to organize over TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and newsletters and Zoom calls. And then something set them ablaze. The 2022 Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization decision stripped away from the American people a constitutional right they had enjoyed for almost 50 years and made it clear that a small minority intended to destroy democracy and replace it with a dictatorship based in Christian nationalism. Ooh, so good from Heather Cox Richardson, who finally concludes by saying, when President Joe Biden announced just a week ago that he would not accept the Democratic nomination for president, he did not pass the torch to Vice President. President Kamala Harris, he passed it to us. It is up to us to decide whether we want a country based on fear or on facts, on reaction or on reality, on hatred or on hope. It is up to us whether it will be fascism or democracy that in the end moves swiftly and up to us whether we will choose to follow in the footsteps of those Americans who came before us in our noblest moments and launch a brand new era in American history. All right. Well, With that said, let's get to your headlines and some clips and then my conversation with Mara Quint. So great to have you here. Can't do the show without your paid subscription. So sign up now if you haven't already. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. All right. Well, a busy weekend in news, of course. Wildfires continue. Smoke puts millions under quality alerts. 
the so-called park fires scorched more than 550 square miles in Northern California as of Sunday, contributed to poor air quality in a large swath of the nor- northwestern U.S. and western Canada. Apparently, it was caused by arson. Some guy pushed a car that was on fire down a hill, and they caught that guy. And, I mean, I just can't imagine being the person who created such wreckage and damage, killing uh, more than a few people apparently already in destroying hundreds of structures and places that have already suffered so much like Paradise, California. Terrible fires, but I'm glad they caught that guy. And I hope people know not to push their burning cars down a hill. A rocket hit Israeli controlled Golan Heights over the weekend after Israel struck a Gaza school hit a sports complex in the Golan Heights filled with children playing soccer on Saturday afternoon. And on the same day that Israeli airstrike in Gaza devastated the school building and killed dozens. So the fighting continues in the Middle East and it's horrific and children continue to die on both sides. News on inflation over the weekend. A new report serves as a reminder that inflation is substantially lower than it was in the 2022 peak, but not entirely vanquished. And here's some good news. A judge issued a final order Friday to overturn the Florida law pushed by Republican Governor Ron DeSantis that attempted to limit diversity and race based discussions in private workplaces. The Stop Woke Act. Well, U.S. District Judge Mark Walker previously ruled the law is unconstitutional and that decision was upheld by an appeals court in March. His latest order makes it a temporary injunction permanent. So that's awesome in Florida. And this is not awesome. New data on threats and harassment toward public officials in the United States show a 15% rise in such incidents during the first half of 2024 compared with 2023. Not a great time to be a public official. That's why it takes a lot of courage. But Princeton University's Bridging Divides Initiative has been conducting this study since January 2022. His authors noted that racially motivated threats were reported higher rates so far this year than those focus on gender, sexual orientation, and identity. And here's some good news. 13 people were rescued after getting lost on an Arizona hiking trail during high heat on Friday, including three children and an adult who were transported to the hospital. Like to hear that. And let's get to the latest in politics. Kamala Harris raised $200 million in the first week of the White House campaign, signed up 170,000 volunteers. Those, my friends, are records in the first seven days. 66% of their contributors coming from first-time donors. Damn, were you one of them? If not, anti up. And just yesterday, a fundraising event for Kamala Harris in the Berkshires, which is Western Massachusetts, a lot of wealthy folks there, pulled in more than $1.4 million, triple what the organizer's original goal was. The mini concert included performances by Yo-Yo Ma and James Taylor. We are 99 days away from Election Day, and things are uh, changing. This uh, Venezuela had their presidential election yesterday. I'm still waiting on results, so I can't mention them. Uh, yet the Federal Reserve this week expected to discuss lowering interest rates tomorrow and the Lollapalooza Musical Festival begins on Thursday if you want to go. Oh, wait, President Biden will announce Supreme Court reform plans next week, this week. He's likely to endorse term limits for justices and ethics code and a constitutional amendment limiting presidential immunity. And now let's get to the audio clips I've got for you today. Always a lot on the Monday show because there's so much happening on Sunday. And I was outside doing all kinds of work yesterday. I listen to so many Sunday shows and different podcasts. And here's what I've got for you. I want to start with this amazing three minute clip from Fox News Sunday, where the anchor Shannon Bream tried really hard to Corner Pete Buttigieg, the transportation secretary and former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, former candidate for president, maybe the vice presidential candidate. I don't think it'll be him, but still, she tries really hard to corner him on immigration. And he tells the story in such an important way that I think everybody has to hear this three minutes. Share it with your friends. Here he is. Connell was for it, the head of the CBP union was for it, and then Trump swooped in to kill it. Not because he thought it was bad policy, but because he didn't want that issue to get better. Because if it got well, worse, it would be better for him politically. And I'll ask Senator Johnson about that. Because there were a number of provisions that Republicans, including Mitch McConnell, ended up in the final product, felt there, there was something they could not vote for there, and they could not move forward. Okay, come on. And, we know we'll, why they didn't move forward. They moved forward because Donald Trump swooped in. He said, I don't want Joe Biden to get away. They felt many of them that it was a flawed piece of legislation come that had too many loopholes. 
loopholes and other things they couldn't support. This is how it Washington was Post. What this is how they describe the border situation. Illegal border crossing soared in the months after Biden took office and immediately rolled back many Trump era restrictions. They go on to say the number of people taken into custody by the U.S. Border Patrol has reached the highest levels in the agency's 100 year history under Biden, averaging two million per year. And there's a lot of that attributed to the fact that there were dozens of things done under the Trump administration that this administration rolled back. And Vice President Harris is part of this administration and had a leading role, according to mainstream media, on handling the border. Let's get real. Border crossings are down in the wake of President Biden's executive actions that he took after Congress failed to act. So he could have taken action. He wanted Congress to resolve that because that would have been more durable. But when Trump came in, talked Republicans out of their own bipartisan project because he didn't want the issue to get better. Remember, The worse things are at the border, the better things get for Donald Trump. So he has a vested interest in it remaining chaotic down there. I think this also helps to explain why he didn't exactly conclusively solve it when it was his turn. But I saw something else really important happening at the Republican National Convention on the border and and the talk about immigration, which we all recognize is a problem, Mm -hmm. which is they tried to paint this narrative that if you live somewhere far from the border and immigration hasn't affected you personally, you need to think that immigration is a driver of crime. That, that was the real message. Immigration leads to crime. Well, there are blue state and governors and, and let, mayors who uh, say every state is a border state now. That's Democrats. Yeah, and now they're saying, but what, the false message of the RNC was that this is leading to an increase in crime. Well, and I think it's really the important the that we that talk have, about have crime. Been very high but profile about people. Of course, people, of they, course they there are individual country, cases, illegally, but this, this is my people point. People would still right? be alive. Trying to make people think that crime is up when crime is down under Joe Biden and crime was up under Donald Trump. Now, I don't know how often that gets reported on this network. So if you're watching this at home, do yourself a favor and look up the data. Well, we invite that. that. uh, Great. So if you look this up at home, you will know that crime went down under Biden and crime went up under Trump. And I think the violent crime for sure. So I think the really important thing to ask is why would America want to go back to the higher crime that we experienced under Donald Trump. Okay, but they also may want to ask why they'd want to go to millions fewer people coming illegal across the border and every single person who's here and was involved with a crime, that's a life that didn't have to be lost. And I think that's the argument being made. We always appreciate you coming and we hope you'll come back again many times. Thanks for having me. And maybe as a vice presidential contender. We'll see. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Pete Buttigieg really doing an effective, effective job as always communicating the truth about immigration. And you know who else does that? The governor of New Mexico is Michelle Lujan Grisham, and she was on Face the Nation with Robert Costa, and she tells a similar story, and she's a border state. Public safety activity at the border in this administration. But what about more border patrol agents? There has been reporting, including a leaked phone call of you speaking about you need more from DHS, you need more border patrol. You've been positive about the administration so far in this conversation, but you've often have been urgent about your need for more resources at the border. Does this administration need to do more for you and your state in terms of allocation of resources and agents or not? They do. And they're going to get that opportunity if Republicans in Congress weren't directed to make sure that they did not do anything to pass a bipartisan border deal that put 1,500 more Border Patrol and 1,200 more ICE agents. You bet. And the shift of Border Patrol by President Biden into ports of entry is exactly what we needed so that we can focus there and then you minimize, right? You can't seek asylum if you're not coming in a port of entry. That gets at coyotes and those inappropriate crossings. So they Mm -hmm. both did something based on my urging and they're on the right side of this new border deal, which will get done when Harris is president, we take the House and we keep the Senate. That is right. That is exactly how it's done. Immigration reform has been tried so many times by Democrats. Republicans refuse to allow it to happen, even when many of them are on board and pass it like they did in 2013 when President Obama was in office. I've said it so many times. Don't let people tell you that the immigration issue is the fault of Democrats. Democrats want to solve it. They've been trying to solve it. You need legislation. You need laws. You need a pathway to citizenship. You need the ability to work and step out of the shadows, to get health care, to go to school, to pay taxes. 
which they are already, uh, many of them actually already paying into and not getting back as they get older like the rest of us. All right, now... The next clip I've got for you is also from CBS Face the Nation. This is Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland, and he is being asked about the visit of Benjamin Netanyahu and the current relationship between the U.S. and Israel. And I love this clip. I thought this is exactly what we need to hear. And this, too, was great communication from a great communicator, Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. Let's begin with your colleague. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. He was on Face the Nation just a few minutes ago. We were talking about Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, his visit to the United States. We're glad to have you here. You've been so outspoken on Israel and its handling of its war with Hamas. He was pretty clipped in talking about why he didn't shake Netanyahu's hand. He said, I just wanted to recognize the relationship between the U.S. and Israel. But he did say he did not say he had any regrets about making that formal invitation. Do you agree with uh, the senator's take on all of this with the Netanyahu visit or not? Well, Robert, it's good to be with you. Um, and just to be very clear, yes, I've been critical of the conduct of the war uh, in Gaza, but always affirmed Israel's right to self-defense, in fact, duty to self-defense. Uh, so, look, uh, the message that I got from my trip to Israel nine days ago, where I met with hostage families, was don't be used as a political prop by Bibi Netanyahu in an address to Congress that will help boost his very low popularity ratings in Israel at a time when he and his extremist colleagues, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, are not prioritizing the return of the hostages. They're not prioritizing a ceasefire and uh, return of the hostages. So they encouraged me, many of them, uh, to express my views in support of the people of Israel by not participating in what they saw was a political ploy by Prime Minister Netanyahu. So that's what I did. All right. There you go. Chris Van Hollen nailing it in that clip in that moment on CBS. I thought that was really important. Now let's move to our disgraced former president who was giving a talk around the corner from where he lives to Christians at Turning Points Actions Believers Summit in West Palm Beach, Florida, And he made headlines when he told the people there that they won't have to vote anymore if he's elected. So I got two clips where conservative Republicans were asked about that. First, it's CNN's State of the Union, Jake Tapper hosting, and he had the evil Tom Cotton, the senator from Arkansas, on, and he played the clip for Tom Cotton to respond to. Trigger alert, you're going to hear Trump's voice very briefly in this clip, and then you're going to hear Tom Cotton try to spin out of it. I want you to take a listen to something uh, former President Trump said Friday night at a gathering of conservative Christians. Get out and vote just this time. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years. You know what? It'll be fixed. It'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christian. Get out. You got to get out and vote. In four years, you don't have to vote again. We'll have it fixed so good you're not going to have to vote. How did you interpret that remark? I think he's obviously making a joke about how bad things have been under Joe Biden and how good they'll be if we send President Trump back to the White House so we can turn the country around again. That's what the American people know. For four years, things were good with President Trump. We had stable prices, a growing economy, peace and stability around the world. Under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, everything has gone to hell. And it will be much worse under Kamala Harris. Just look at her record. She wants to ban private health insurance. She wants to ban fossil fuel production. She wants to ban guns. She wants even wants to ban plastic. Not all guns, some kinds of guns. She wants to forcibly confiscate guns without even an act of Congress to do so. Kamala Harris is a dangerous liberal. She makes Joe Biden look competent and moderate by contrast. All right. Well, there is a example of what we're going to hear a lot more of from Trump supporters and opponents of Kamala Harris. But here is another Republican having to answer for the same question. This is a former governor of New Hampshire, Chris Sununu, who is a disgrace for a lot of reasons. And to his New Hampshire name, which is famous there, Sununu, because he was a supporter of Nikki Haley's and uh, was very critical of Donald Trump. And now he's fallen in line. And that's why he's a disgrace. And that's why he does not answer this question very well either. Here's a quick clip from ABC News. Martha Raddatz was hosting, and she asked Chris Sununu about Trump's comments about never having to vote again. 
President Trump facing some backlash for those comments Friday night, saying his supporters won't have to vote again in four years. I'm joined now by the Republican governor of New Hampshire, Chris Sununu. Governor, what the heck did he mean there? <laughs> well, I think I think that was a classic Trumpism, if you will. Uh, I think he's just trying to make the point that this stuff can be fixed. Uh, you know, obviously, it's uh, we want everybody to vote in all elections. But I think he was just trying to make a, 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 a hyperbolic point that uh, that it can be fixed as long as he gets back into office and all that. But, you know, classic Trump right there. OK. And then Martha Reddits wanted to move on. I don't think she should have. Actually, I think she should have stayed on that. Anyway, everybody was up in arms about Trump saying that as you should be about everything that he says. But you know what we love? We love Tim Waltz. I opened the show with him. Let's go back to the governor of Minnesota, who some are saying should be considered for vice president. And I'm sure he's being vetted and considered. But here he is. This is another great clip from him. Of all her potential running mates, you might have the most progressive record as governor. I know you were more of a moderate when you were in the House, but you've legalized recreational marijuana. You passed universal background checks on guns. You expanded LGBTQ protections. You implemented tuition-free college for low-income Minnesotans. There's uh, free uh, breakfast and lunch uh, for school kids. Do you think your record is an asset to the ticket, or would it risk fueling Trump's attacks as you being a big government liberal? What a monster. Kids are eating eating and having full belly so they they can go learn and women are making their own health care decisions and uh, we're a top five business state and uh, we also rank in the top three of happiness. Look, they're going to label whatever they're going to label. He's going to roll it out, mispronounce names, you know, to try and make the case. The fact of the matter is where you see the policies that uh, Vice President Harris was a part of making, Democratic governors across the country executed those policies and quality of life is higher. The economies are better. All of those things, educational attainment is better. So, yeah, my kids are going to eat here and you're going to have a chance to go to college and you're going to have an opportunity to live where we're working on reducing carbon emissions. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have personal incomes that are higher and you're going to have health insurance. So if that's where they want to label me, uh, I'm more than happy to take the label. All right. I love it. Love it. And now let's go to MSNBC, where they had a brief montage of black women responding to Kamala Harris's candidacy. And I just had to share this one with you. I thought this was great. These three different women. She doesn't have to go out there and sell sneakers or Bibles. <laughs> you know? All she did was announce that she's running. And they said, where do we sign up? And I think she going to give Trump what he need. He ain't ready for this one. The level of energy is higher. And we just got to keep this up. We only have 100 days left. We can run through the finish line. Don't slow down, but keep going. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Very, very inspiring. I really liked that clip and thought it was great. Wanted to share that one with you. And now here's another MSNBC clip. They put together Jen Psaki's show, put together a montage of Democrats calling J.D. Vance and Donald Trump weird, which I talk with Mara about and its effectiveness. Here it is. And I think it starts with Tim Waltz, who may have started this, according to Mara. It may have been the, one of the first one to call them weird and have it be so effective. Just in the past few days, Democrats have kind of organically settled on a new attack line against Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Basically, these guys are just plain weird. You know there's something wrong with people when they talk about freedom, freedom to be in your bedroom, freedom to be in your exam room, freedom to tell your kids what they can read. That stuff is weird. They come across weird. They seem obsessed with this. We're using this fake living room to talk to you about a super weird idea from J.D. Vance. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's quite weird. But what was weird was him joking about racism today and and, and then talking about Diet Mountain Dew. Who, who drinks Diet Mountain Dew? And on the other side, they're just weird. I mean, they really are. Some of what he and his running mate are saying, well, it's just plain weird. (laughs) All right. There you go. Good stuff. Really good stuff. I love it. It's catching on. And now let's go to CNN's City Union, where Jay Tapper had Elizabeth Warren on, who previewed and talked about the importance of Supreme Court reform, which hopefully we'll hear from President Biden this week. Here's two minutes from Elizabeth Warren. One of the issues President Biden said he would focus on in the remainder of his term is reform of the U.S. Supreme Court. Among the changes he's reportedly considering are term limits uh, and an enforceable ethics code for justices. Now, you've been working on this issue in the Senate. What realistically do you think you could get through Congress? Not what should be, but what do you think you could actually accomplish? Yeah, well, I think we've got all the Democrats who are ready for 
meaningful ethics reform to bind the Supreme Court. And we're working on changes to the Supreme Court. It can be term limits. It could be adding the number of justices, things we can do without having to have a constitutional amendment. I think what President Biden is doing is think about this moment Here is a man who's been a transformative president. He's got an enormous amount done, and yet he has stepped away and he has passed the torch to Kamala Harris. Why has he done that? He's done it as an act of patriotism for our nation. And he is saying we not only have to have a president who is here for the nation and who will heal us and bring us together, we also have to change our Supreme Court, because right now we have a Supreme Court that has basically jumped the guardrails and is out there giving power to the president, uh, saying that the president can commit any act that the president wants, uh, saying that Congress cannot authorize agencies to act. So we've got a Supreme Court that is actively undermining our democracy. And I think what Joe Biden will do over the next six months is he's going to keep drawing that to the attention of the American people and reminding them when they vote in November, the Supreme Court is on the ballot. And that is a good reason to vote for Kamala Harris and to vote for Democrats in both the Senate and the House. And let's end our sound clips back on a laugh, which I always like to do. And Barry Ritholtz actually sent me this. He texted me. He's like, this is hilarious. This is Chelsea Handley, Handler, comedian Chelsea Handler, making a very funny one and a half minute video that I think will make you laugh and motivate you at the same time. Oh, hey. As you might have heard, Donald Trump's running mate and future star of his own Dateline episode, J.D. Vance, is ruffling quite a few feathers this week. We're effectively run in this country by a bunch of childless cat ladies who look at Kamala Harris. The entire future of the Democrats is controlled by people without children. Listen up, you wingnut elegy. This country is still controlled by men in systems that were set up by men that are carefully crafted to continue to benefit men. So to put it in women-hating terms, you'll understand you're being hysterical. But let's be clear, there's no correlation between childless people and the presidency. For example, our very first United States president, Mr. George Washington, didn't have children. In fact, he had two stepchildren. That's right. Just like someone else I know. And to your point about Kamala not being fit because she's not a mother, I'd like to remind you that no president in the history of the United States has ever been a mother. But maybe if she had five kids with three different men and a scandalous affair with a porn star and was convicted felon, that would be more powerful palatable to Republican men. I mean, my God, are we tired. You sad diet, Mountain Dew drinking, couch humping, dolphin porn aficionado. All of us childless cat and dog ladies are going to go from childless and crushing it to childless and crushing you in November. And before you tell me he didn't really fuck a couch, spare me. I grew up in New Jersey in the 80s where everyone had a couch in their basement. And I know a couch fucker when I see one. Ah, hilarious. I know a couch fucker when I see one. All right, that's it. That's all I've got for you in this first section of the show. We did 30 minutes, though, huh? You're all caught up. You're updated. You've heard it all. You're inspired, hopefully, by Heather Cox Richardson and some of these other clips as well. But now it's time to get to my one of our favorites, Mara Quint. She's a writer. She's an activist. She works for Americans for Tax Freedom, which is an awesome nonprofit. She's one of the smartest and one of the fun She's one of the smartest, funniest people I know. Those are the types of folks I like to get on the show. One of my favorite people to comment on just about anything. And I've got her here today. I hope you'll follow her on Twitter and Blue Sky and TikTok. Tell her you heard her here. And let's do it right now with Mara Quint. I can't tell you the details, but right. I'm fighting, you know, down. you're fighting crime of some sort. I think you're... I, mean, t- I could be on the fighting crime side, sure. Why don't you go ahead and assume that? Yeah, I'm fighting the crime. Yeah, I not feel causing like- it. You're behind a lot of the bad things that happen to the super wealthy. That's what I feel like. That is your secret identity is that you actually. I'm trying to tell you I'm an orca, but I haven't known how. <laughs> I just did see that five orcas overturned a yacht. Is that what you were referring to? Again, I've done it multiple times now. The orcas are waging a much better and more coordinated war than we ever have on, <laughs> on the rich. And I am in their debt, really. Free all the willies. They are, they are doing it. <laughs> You are not watching the Olympics. I am not watching the Olympics. It's basically day two or three. Hard to know are what's happening. Are we terrible happening. Americans for that? 
I don't know. I think you get into it however you get into it. You hear some of the stories. You hear the Simone Biles story, the women's soccer team or the men's basketball team details. But then there's a lot of other I things. I have seen some TikToks from oh, okay. the Olympic Village, if that counts. Yeah. I've seen like some TikToks. I want to say from like the women's rugby team. Oh, just like fangirling over other female athletes. And those have been really cute. That's the entirety of my involvement with the Olympics thus far. I feel like the Olympics every year is just a kind of a way to discover new sports, new events that have been added. And yeah. I just learned that surfing was an Olympic sport. I suppose I knew that, but I was, I, I do not even oh. have a competition for surfing. How do you know that day, the waves? I don't know anything about surfing. I, I guess, guess the sharks decide basically <laughs> like <laughs> they, they determine the winner. And then if, if you're allowed to swim out, you meddled. Imagine if you were having the best ride of your life at the Olympics and a shark interfered somehow. And let's see. That sounds terrible. I really don't want to imagine that. Give me a different thing to imagine. I'm just not trying to look at some of these obscure uh, events. Anyway, we're not paying attention. There's much more important things. That's what we talk about here. We're paying attention to the important Olympics, which is politics. Let me just it's basically the same thing. Team sports, raw. I get excited when your person's doing real well and you cheer on the sideline. Don't you, do you feel, um, this is a big question I want to ask you, because you can be pessimistic, like a lot of people I talk to on a regular basis, Christian Finnegan, uh, J.L. Covan, my friend Jared Yates Sexton, and I appreciate the, the, the that's where you are on the spectrum. How do you feel right now, given the situation that has developed, Kamala Harris and Democrats consolidating their support across the country behind her, breaking records in fundraising, donations, new donors, volunteers, all of it. What are you, are you positive on this? I was feeling pretty good until you compared me to Christian Finnegan, and then you just tanked my whole day. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. My bad. Rough. No, it's been really interesting to watch this happen. I have to say I was a complete agnostic in terms of whether Biden should stay in the race or leave the race. And I, I saw very strong reasons for both. I think both sides that were yelling vociferously that he should stay or he should leave were making some good points. And I don't think anyone knew uh, what was the best course? People were being that, really mean to each other if they didn't agree. I didn't like that at all. They were, and that sucked, but I'm going to chalk that one up to how terrified everyone is. Like, yeah. everybody w is really scared. Yeah. I think we all across the board recognize the stakes at hand here. So when you're seeing people get really upset, it is because they have a strong conviction that th this is the right thing to do and no one's listening. Now, why they, they felt they are the one person who knew what to do and had the, the strong conviction that was right. That's something they need to work out with their therapist. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> no, really? But Come I on. certainly, I understood what was driving the intensity of the clashing that yeah. was happening. For sure. No, you, yeah, you're right. It was fear and panic and anxiety about what was going to happen and what's the right thing to do. And, and, and that's, so now what? And now how do you feel? So it's real complicated. I feel good. Let's say that. I do feel good. I, I There has been such a fantastic surge of support. And one of the most exciting things to me is, obviously, she has raised instantly a huge amount of money. But you're hearing a lot that the down ballot candidates are also seeing a ton, a big surge in fundraising for them. So the fact that she's having this effect down ballot is huge. That's like that alone is such an exciting thing. So I love seeing that. I love seeing the excitement. I think it really has energized so many sectors. I think now here's where I'm a, a terrible, annoying <laughs> pragmatist. I don't, I can't get fully swept up in that for a couple of reasons. I'm really excited it's happening. I want to see it going. I would never, ever want to dampen anyone's hope, enthusiasm, or excitement. I Yes, go all in on that. It is so necessary. I, but I think it is worth noting that it is not now a foregone conclusion that we have President Harris. I don't think that's the case. And when I was looking at the responses when Biden stepped down and Harris stepped up and I was watching which groups of people I knew were feeling which ways about it, there was a huge amount of support and enthusiasm from especially from like really plugged into online communities, mm -hmm. the groups that I saw being like were some of my close friends who do on the ground organizing in states like Pennsylvania and swing states who were like, oh, fuck, 
things just got harder because we forget sometimes too, like how much name recognition does a lot. And Biden has a strong name recognition. And a lot of these organizers as well have been, they've been working hard for years. Like it's not as though they started doing this work a couple of months ago when election season officially began. They've been doing this work for many years. They've not seen necessarily an alternative. They've been working hard to really try and sell Biden. And now there is this sort of shift and they have to turn those voters to Harris. And they're often working in places where Harris doesn't really have a very strong name recognition. They may be up against sexism and racism. They may also, I think in a lot of these places, be up against a strong sense of elitism. She's a Californian. Mm. Like, what does she know of my life kind of feeling? And these people are working hard and they're going to keep working hard. And I'm not certainly not saying, oh, we're screwed now. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it's worth recognizing that the people who are on the ground doing the work are now having to work harder and we should lend them as much support as possible because... Uh there's a lot of communities where Harris is not necessarily just an automatic. Sure. Yeah, of course she has my vote. That's not the case. There's work to be done to sell it. I was listening to an interview with Ben Wickler, the democratic organizer in Wisconsin, yeah. and, and he had a bunch of suggestions for what we can all do. One of the suggestions was go and live in a swing state. And I've been thinking about it. I mean, he put his money where his mouth is. He moved to Wisconsin and good for him. Oh, I didn't realize he did that. Oh, yeah. No, Ben. I mean, like that, that is he is living that truth. And it's very impressive. Do you know him? Uh, Not well. I'm sure he doesn't know me, but I'm very familiar with him. We work in the same spaces. And yeah, I I want to maybe do that. And I just don't know how I can be affected, but I want to do the show. I'm thinking about Pennsylvania because it's right next door and you live there and know a lot of organizers. So we'll talk about it. But either Pennsylvania or maybe I could go to Michigan. I just don't know how I can be necessarily helpful, but I would broadcast live from these places. And I think I would just work on the get out the vote. And also, I'm super charming and convincing. Sure. Sure. I think you do really well. You said Michigan. I'm like, you do look like you work in an auto factory. So that might be a natural place for you to go. I said the other day, I look like a gay lawyer. And my friend Tina said, you do not look like a lawyer. You do not. No. So I think that's a really important thing to do. And we'll talk more about it. Let me ask you about Kamala Harris a little bit more. You're a misogynist and a sexist. How do you think those at- types of attacks will be effective against her or will they actually help her because they're really alienating a lot of women, maybe women that we need, maybe white women. <laughs> Look, rarely would I ever have any reason to say thanks, Trump, but thanks, Trump, on the gift of J.D. Vance. What uh, an absolute loser yeah. that guy is. He's so fantastically energizing. To, he just... I think he reminds everyone of the worst person they know. Like in some way, <laughs> like that guy you worked with, you're just like, oh, I fucking hate that guy. Oh, my God. I think he triggers that in a real strong majority of Americans. And that's nice to run against. It's so great to run against that one guy in your office that like gives you really uncomfortable vibes. Ugh. That's fantastic. So I think that's going to be really helpful because he's leading a lot of the misogyny that's coming out there. And he is just so just unlikable. Just as well. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Sorry. No. So I, I think that's a useful thing that we have in our corner. I think a lot of the we've seen the Republicans have already said like, back off on the race and the, the identity. Some stuff. of the smarter <laughs> Republican advisors have said, including apparently Mike Johnson, the, the speak, speaker of the House, who's an extremist. He's saying that maybe we should not play these cards. Oh, They're guys, not. Cool it on the things we actually believe. Don't say them as loudly. We've gotten real comfortable lately. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. Like, it's true. But I actually do think that they have gotten so comfortable, they're not able to rein that in. It's the, what is the, the saying? The something's out of the box? Or I don't know. But it's too late. The horses are out of the gate. Toothpaste, I think, has left the tube. That works, too. I, there's probably a lot of these now. I think the bus left the station on that. This, oh, these are good. These are good. We can make up some new ones, too. But all of the ones I'm thinking of are really dirty. Moving right along, I think that they're going to have a really hard time choking that from their base and from a lot of their electeds. And I think that is going to be helpful. I don't think that Trump is going to win a lot of new voters. I think the real question is, 
Trump was in a place where he was lagging a bit in his voters and in his voters' devotion. Obviously, you have the hardcore crazy people who will follow him around like he's the Beatles. But you actually, I think, saw some decline in, in enthusiasm for him from a lot of the people that voted for him. And I do think, though, that running against Harris is probably going to re-energize some of those people to show up. I think their senses of hatred are going to compel them to yeah. hold in a way that Biden maybe wouldn't have. Let's stay with the ladies, the females, young and old, white and black and brown and everything, because I heard somebody and I've heard a lot of people referring to this ticket as the most anti-woman ticket ever. J.D. Vance and Donald oh. Trump. And Quite overtly anti-woman, let's say. Well, you've got the rhetoric and the petty bullshit, they say, the kind of sexist daily sexism stuff and pretty outrageous sexism stuff. And then, of course, you've got more importantly, policy. Trump obviously appoints the Supreme Court justices who <laughs> overturn reproductive rights. J.D. Vance is on record of wanting a national ban. And then you got Project 2025 where it's all spelled out and they're going to be charting your menstrual cycles. It's all. And finally, I feel like the point being Biden wasn't really good at talking about that. He had this weird Catholic hang up. It just wasn't that convincing. Kamala Harris always has been on the issue. And now you've got a woman running for on top of the ticket. The main issue has always been reproductive rights. And you get this anti-woman ticket. It seems to be coming into perfect formation for Kamala Harris and for women and for this issue. It's definitely a real choice. And if Trump were to win in the fall, it's such an unbelievable, like, it's hard for me to even think through that possibility. But but obviously, it it remains a possibility, unfortunately. It, It will really... I don't think we can go forward doing anything the way we're doing it. And obviously, I don't think we'll be allowed to go forward doing anything the way it's been done if Trump were to win. But it it would be such a ridiculous tyranny of the minority in this country that is set up that way because of the Electoral College. It's a real it's a real tough thing. But right now we have a, a clear, clean choice. It is not just two old men. It is, yeah, the evils on one side and then. At least someone representing women and hope and progress and future. And it's tricky, I think. Sorry, I'm like, now I'm, I'm wondering, but. Um, Did you say the evils? The evils, yeah. Yep. That's, um, the evils. Yep, no, that's good. I think it's been really interesting to see the support for Harris from progressives because yeah. Harris, she's not a progressive hero, like not in terms of the policies that she's put forth. She's put forth some things that have been pretty good. But it's usually been in response to pressure because everyone else is doing it and she's got to step up. She's not been a leader on progressive issues, certainly. And obviously her record as a prosecutor is really troubling from a progressive stance. And so I think that's And yet really- they're going to say that's her vulnerability. She's punished a lot of people, black and brown people, and they're going to say her vulnerability is that she's let people go and didn't punish them hard enough. Interesting how it'll I know, be seen. Isn't, that, yeah. isn't that fascinating? I've been really interested in that. But what I've been, what's been nice to see is because I think the, the left in this country gets such a bad rap for this sort of purity politics. Yeah. And I think we're seeing right now, that's just not the case. The amount of progressives who are like, yeah, I, I have a real problem with Harris and a lot of Harris's records and a lot of the things she stands for. And I am all in on her. Yeah. Because of course, because of course, because I have to be, because I am not voting out of some sort of sense of purity of ideology. I'm not going to find an ideologically pure candidate. I'm voting to preserve democratic institutions so that we can continue to move things further left. And I really just want to give voice to that because I think, I don't know, we've just seen such a demonization of the left and I've just seen the left absolutely rise to the occasion here and lead the way on this moment. Yeah, your perspective on that question, I was going to ask you it. You just answered it. What are you seeing on the progressive Democrats, liberals, however you want to call folks? And you just gave the answer because you would know. And you're on social media, you're in policy circles and activism and, and you get it all. Speaking of which. I think that if the Harris campaign were smart, they would hire you for messaging. But until they do, I want to get your they comments. They don't need to. I want to know who's doing their comms because well, that's what I, this is my big comms is this fantastic. Is my big question to you is their communication strategy and what they're doing and how they're doing it and what they're saying. It is I've always wanted to see a campaign at this level use these kind of 
tactics and techniques in terms of humor and messaging. But now you can leverage social media in a way you couldn't even four years ago. There's so many platforms and so easy to get a slick video out. And finally, Mari, you've got all these independent uh, individuals and organizations like Midas Touch and Lincoln uh, Project making their own videos, helping the candidate. And so what is your thoughts on the communication strategy from the campaign itself so far? I have been absolutely blown away and I've seen so many badly run campaigns and I it's hard. It's really hard to run a good campaign. When I say badly run, it's not like I'm indicting the people leading it. I'm sure they tried very hard, but it is so many things to stay on top of and you have to be so thoughtful. And the main takeaway that I'm getting right now because of the speed at which they are responding to things, and I don't know who's leading the comms on her side, but whoever is, has been empowered to do things which is not always the case. A lot of times you have a structure in place where it's like, oh, we need this approval and that approval and we got to talk and we got to get things through. And and it really mucks everything up because comms has to be very quick. Yeah, They have good people and they have given them the ability to run with things. And that is, oh, it's so refreshing because you feel it on the other side, whether you understand what's causing it or what's behind it, you feel it. You feel that energy when they are responding to things so instantly. I saw a video... Like yesterday, I think it was like a TikTok. It was, oh, it was just so clean and so perfect. It was just a clip from a Trump rally and Trump's doing one of his ridiculous voices. And he's like, they're going to say that, oh, she's the prosecutor and I'm the convicted felon. And then it just cuts there and goes, I'm Kamala Harris and I approve this message. Uh, that's, that's awesome. It. Just beautiful. Yes. So clean. Yes. And the fact that they are allowing that team, like they have creativity on the team to do it and they're allowed to just run with it, I think is making all the difference. Yeah. I really want to know what you thought about that. So I'm happy to hear you. I'm so excited. I want to find out. I'm like, I haven't really looked into it, but I'm like, I want to find out who's doing it because I want to befriend them. (laughs) Yeah. But you should just send them. I'm definitely. Will you be my friend? Yeah, I want to find out too and, and make them be your friend and have you participate in some of that messaging, which I think is really effective. You're using the word weirdo and weird. And yeah, and that was really Tim Waltz. And he the governor said that. of Minnesota is a very effective communicator. Yeah, he said that. And that, but that's another one where he said it. It worked. It resonated. And they got that right away. It huh. wasn't a big conversation. Right. It wasn't like, oh, we've got to pull this message. It was like, nope, people responded. Run with it. And that is amazing because, yeah, it's such a good attack. The Trump is weird. And these guys are weirdos is so great because it's not particularly cruel. And. Because weird is such this open word, and we don't, I think most on the left, don't struggle with the word weird. If someone, if I said to you, Pete, you're weird, you'd be like, yep, I am. Like, it's not like a thing that you would be like, how dare you? It's a compliment because you don't, you want to be original and you want to be different and nonconformist. So it's usually, it's taken as an insult by most people. But yeah, I think a lot of folks think of it as, as I do, as you're saying, yeah. That's yeah. And in this case, it. obviously, you can use it in these different ways. And it's not being used as a compliment, but it is so ups- it is so upsetting to Trump. There's nothing he wants to be less than weird. Like, that's awful. And it's really refreshing to simply call out that these people are not in step with the rest of us. Like, they are out of touch, man. Like, that is something really, weird going on over there. It is really resonating. And I wonder if it's because, I just thought of this, that Trump's been on the scene since, uh, for over 10 years now. And we've tried everything. It, let's let him be him. He's a rapist. He's a convict. He's a racist. He's hanging out with Nazis. He's a horrible person in every way. But one thing we never called him is just weird and laughed at him, called him a weirdo. No one ever tried that. And I think J.D. Vance being added to the ticket is why it probably resonates even more. Yeah, no, it very much reminds me of the, and I loved this, the sort of protests where when you'd have, you know, the white nationalists and Nazis in cities. It's my favorite form of protest when people would dress up like uh, clowns and just play music real loud and drown them out and do clowning acts alongside where it's just, it's just look at these fucking weirdos. It's just calling out the absurdity of what is happening and doing it in a way that is, is not violent or cruel, but is making it very plain and very straightforward that this is not like the rest of us. And I, I think that is really, really powerful because yeah, we know he's terrible and evil, but they love that. That also 
implies a power, right? There's a, a powerful feeling about being horrible and evil because you have the ability to do weirdos or just like, oh, there's, I don't know. There's no power to being weird. Yeah. yeah. What do you make of these kind of grassroots organizing calls that have occurred? And does this momentum end? Everybody's calling it a honeymoon period. And I'm telling you, 99 days left. I don't see anybody stopping. And here's the reason we were all going to work as hard as we could, but we were going to be bitter and jaded and cynical and a lot of fear. And now we're happy warriors. Now we're going to take join it. Now we actually want to go to work and do things. And we've got all kinds of new people volunteering. So I don't see this being a honeymoon. It's only 99 days. It's two months. It's not going to, the enthusiasm, I think, is not going to run out. And we're going to see more interesting things like these grassroots calls that have raised millions of dollars. And what do you think of my white, bald men for Kamala call? That'll be fun because I'll have, it, I think the bit alone will be funny because if I get 50 or 90 or 100 or 200 bald white men, you'll have all these little heads on Zoom. And that image alone, I think, would be funny. I'm not lying. I love this so much. Yeah, I'm doing it. Absolutely do it. Good. You should. You should absolutely for sure. But the real question is: Can people wear a bald cap? Is that cool? Like how? No. No. You have to prove. You'll have to prove your natural baldness somehow. There'll be some kind of a threshold. I I think it's wonderful. I'm very happy about it. You might want to open it up to just simply bald men. You might not, but I think it's. I think it's great. Well, the black guys had their call. They did. And there's there's white men are having a call too, though. So white men saying. are having their call, but white bald men have a certain sensitivity <laughs> to the sun. I see. Okay. Regardless, I don't care how you do it. I think it's great. I love it. And I think you're right. Like there, it, it's a short period of time. I think there's going to be some more waves of enthusiasm. I think when you talk about a, a honeymoon period, I think you're talking about fundraising honeymoon period. I do think that's the case. You're going to have an initial, just in general, with all fundraising, like yeah. you, you get an initial big push and then subsequent pushes are are less. I think that's to be expected. But no, I think it's quite possible that the enthusiasm will sustain. And I I definitely think that Trump and Vance and their whole, their whole little (laughs) bubble of, of evil weirdos are going to continue to create moments of enthusiasm for the other side, for us. They're going to, they're going to say and do things that are going to be energizing and invigorating. They can't help it because they're just ridiculous and awful. So that I think will definitely work. You've got two other things that are definitely going to happen. The DNC uh, before that, the nominee, Mm -hmm. whoever that's going to be, and potential debates and hopefully so that you can write about them at McSweeney's. But your thoughts on the VP pick, especially given how you think about policy, tax policy in particular, or anything else? Are you, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because we speculate and then it's going to be over. Yeah, it's a complicated one, but I think most people are expecting that the other half of the ticket is going to be a sort of established white man. I think that's generally the case. Waltz is obviously like moving up the the ranks in terms of being. It doesn't look right. I'm with Trump on casting. I think you got to look the. I think you got to look the part. Tim Waltz looks like a a hardware store owner. He's got the white hair around. Isn't that good? Did you know? I I have not verified this. So if I'm wrong, Hmm. I got bad intel, but I think he's six months older than her, which to me would it was oh, that's hilarious. absolutely stunning. Well, piece of information. continue with the like, case. And I probably should have asked you, one of the front runners is Josh Shapiro. He is your governor. So you know him and maybe you could tell us. Something I about would him. say no on Shapiro. I'm definitely in the camp of do not, that it should not be Shapiro. I think Shapiro is. He's the same age as her. Yeah. Tim Waltz and Kamala Harris. Isn't that why? Tell me that man does not look 20 years older. She doesn't look anywhere near she her looks age. Great, but yeah. still, come yeah. on. Anyway, so I'm not in the camp of Shapiro for a couple of reasons. One, I think Shapiro is a bit divisive, I Hmm. think, within their communities that really dislike a lot of his policies that he's put forth. And I think that's fair as a Pennsylvanian. I take issue with a lot of the things that he has said and done. So from a sort of negative stance, I think it's fair to say Shapiro is not your best pick. Also from the other side, even though I have a lot of issues with Shapiro, I don't really want to lose Shapiro from Pennsylvania right now because I don't mm. think that a flood of progressive left leaning politicians take that slot. I think that you have a lot of opportunity then to open that up to Pennsylvania Republicans and you need Democrats at the head of the ticket on the swing states. So I think that's a dangerous thing to pull Shapiro. So yeah, I would 
not do Shapiro. I know Buttigieg has gotten a lot of attention for this possibility. Yeah, what do you think of that? I don't love it. I don't hate it. A lot of people, I think the strongest pro for Buttigieg actually that I have heard is look at the dynamics between them. They get along really well hmm. and they like bounce off each other in a way that is, is really appealing and really positive. And so like that to me, that's the biggest selling point. I think I hate to take a sort of like conservative stance and say you should have a sort of like straight cis white man. Maybe you should. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it matters. I don't think that like having a gay man as a vice president pick really changes the ticket in a way that's going to lose a lot of votes. But I, I guess some like little part of my conservative upbringing is, oh, that's too far. Don't push it. Don't push it. I don't want to put you on the spot. I'll get some guests on this. But one of the things that a lot of uh, analysts, the kind of never Trump Republicans, I've heard a couple of them saying it and others that Kamala Harris is, quote, weak on is fracking. Because I guess in the past when she ran for president, maybe she was for banning fracking. Pennsylvania banned fracking for 12 years at one point. A lot of people saw that documentary, Gasland. A lot of people know uh, the horrible effects of just uh, what it does to the mm-hmm. current planet, your ground, your property, etc. Not to mention methane, natural gas, real bad for the climate. Very dangerous fossil fuel. And so they're saying, oh, Kamala Harris, she's, she's against fracking. That's going to be a weak point for her. Does she lose or win Pennsylvania because of her past stance on that? That's a really good question. And honestly, I don't know. My instinct is no. I don't think that's, mm. that has a huge issue. Obviously, it is more of a concern within Pennsylvania than I want to admit that it is. But do I think jobs that and it money. is... A lot of people working in there. Exactly, jobs and money, sure. But do I think that fracking in particular is like a, a swing issue for that many voters? I don't think so. But I do think she is going to have to be real strong on economic issues that really make sense to working people. And a lot of... I mean, I think Bernie got slammed the other day for saying something like she can't win unless she appeals to the economic concerns of a lot of these kind of rust belt states. And he got slammed because he worded it badly and it sounded like he was saying she can't win, which is not what he was saying. But but I do think there is something there that especially again, and I hate saying this, but she's from California. And that is something that kind of sticks, right? Is, oh, well. California liberal. We're not California. Like that's a different part of the world. They have different beliefs. And there's a lot of, I I notice I moved from California to Pennsylvania. There is a lot of looking down your nose at California in particular, really more than any other state. Uh, California people looking down their nose at you. No, no. Like you're looking uh, back the center of the country being like those fucking freaks deserve whatever the hell they get. There's a lot of whatever they're doing out there is bad and and is out of touch and is ridiculous and has no bearing on my life. And so I do think that that Harris will do well to really make a point to try to speak the language of a lot of these voters throughout the center swaths of the country. Are you looking at the same time? I don't really. I'm saying all of this and I believe all of this. But fundamentally, the I, and I hate saying this because I work in policy, right? Like, yeah. This is what I care about policy mm. very deeply. I don't think this is an election about policy. I just don't. I think this is an election about we know what the sides are. And the sides are not minute policy choices. They are not like, oh, well, he's saying policy. bring the tax rate to 22 and he's saying right. 38. And it's not that. It is so much bigger than that and it's so much more of a broad concept of what sort of world do you foresee for the future? And so I think that fundamentally, it's really just going to be about the turnout, about energizing the people. And I think, unfortunately, both sides, fortunately or unfortunately, I think Harris's entry into the race has energized both sides on that. So now I think it's really a, a big push to who can do more. And I think the most important thing in this particular election is not necessarily these like policy debates. I think it is, are we registering democratic voters in key places? And are we going to the colleges and the universities? Are we going to, to prison populations? Are we going to elderly populations and having these conversations, these populations that often are neglected 
or or overlooked when we're doing these voter yeah and there might be some that are in play now that nobody ever thought would be you saw a lot of buzz around the villages in florida which is old white folks and a lot of conservative people and they were registering and raising a whole bunch of money for kamala in the villages so maybe there are places that are in play that people need to we need to well and Harris, I think, I don't know if she did this already or if she's planning to do it, but I did see that she's going to Florida, which is a place that mm. Democrats have written off. Yeah. So it, it seems as that. though, yeah, it seems as though they, they're, the campaign is aware that, you know what, we're not going to make any foregone conclusions that we have already lost any particular areas and we're going to do some work because, yeah, I think we're going to see some unusual voter patterns this election because I, like I said, I don't think it is going to be policy driven. Outside of some big things, like I, I do think that abortion and reproductive rights are, are going to be an energizing factor, but I do not think that like my new policy detail is going to win this election. Yeah. Abortion, democracy, and just fear of <laughs> the divisiveness and the return of the most evil man in America. You are so smart. It's so great to hear your views on all of these things and get your take. I always love it. I appreciate you joining me as always. And what else Thanks, wait, are, 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 are you looking for? Just looking ahead, DNC debates, anything that you're looking for? I'm so interested to see if he debates. I saw that he was going to be trying to wriggle out of that instantly and he's working real hard yeah. to get out of it. I would be surprised, actually. I would be real surprised if he gets on the debate stage. Why do I you mean, think he will? Why do you think he doesn't want to do it? Because he knows he's going to get crushed. He knows it. He's crushed. He can't. Um, all of his attacks are to be very like aggressive and hateful. And he's already been told that that's not going to work well. That's mm. going to like backfire on you. But it's all he knows how to do. So he's going to, if he gets up there, his best lines of attack are going to be implications of, oh, that's a very mean tone. It's going to be like things of, oh, implying that she's a little out of control or she's a little, she's a little bit too angry or maybe, maybe she's on her period. That's not, that's the the sort of like stuff he's going to fall back on. And that's all he has. And I think he recognizes that is actually all he has. It's funny that I laughed at that and then realized he did say that about Megyn Kelly. She's got blood coming from I don't know where. Like, yeah. It's not actually something that's hyperbolic. He actually has. There's nothing hyperbolic no. about him. Like if, uh, you know, if you can dream it. it, he can be it as long as it's evil enough. You. OK, now I'll let you go. Thank you so much, Mara. That was awesome. Thanks, Pete. All right. There she goes. Mara Quint, everybody. Thank you very much for listening to today's show all the way to the end. You bumblebees are the very best. That's what you could call it if you listen all the way to the end, in case you didn't know. Cannot do it without you and your support. Sign up now. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Pay more if you'd like. I could use it. That's for darn sure. Got to keep this baby on the road, on the rails, and I can't do it without you. Review the show on whatever podcast app you're listening to, probably Spotify or iTunes rather apple and those reviews matter a lot follow me on all the social medias and that is that is it that's all i've got for you john carroll does the music for the show he is a grammy award winning singer songwriter we are so happy to have him and so many other talented artists in our community if you want to create something for the show or be a part of it let me know stand up at gmail.com send me your vitamin n everybody i'm short on vitamin n so get outside and send me those photos have a great one and i'll talk to you right here tomorrow where a new day has arrived my friends On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all they had to 
stand up. They had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. Why you lying awake wondering where the money all went? It'll be the cost of freedom that'll go on its best. If you can see him flee the scene of that experiment, if you can stand up. And raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside. And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up.